Greetings, my name is Matthew Conley. And we are here to introduce the Six Sigma 64 bit processor. Thank you. Let's talk about it first. Where do we get the name from? The Six Sigma, if any of you watch 30 Rock, um, Jack Donnie dra drops out all the time. It was instituted in 1986 by Motorola. It's a um, it's a standard of production that's basically antiquated. It doesn't really make any sense, but it's basically saying you turn out a product that gets the, pro the proper results 99.99% of the time. That's 4.5 sigma. So six sigma is actually a fictional thing that can't be attained. So it's kind of a funny thing, but we strive for beyond perfection. Um, anyways, to cue the slide. Six sigma is a set of strategies, techniques, and tools for purposes improvement, specifically terms associated with statistical modeling. It's what I just said. So that's what we got the name from. Next slide, please. General characteristics. Okay, I'll do it. Uh, we designed this 64 processor using HDL, Verilog specifically. It's a reduced instruction set, computing cycle, computing style processor. Uh, it operates in little Indian format and uses the von Neumann style architecture wherein your instruction data is in the same location as your met data memory. Instruction memory is in, in the same location as your data memory. Sorry. Next slide, please. Uh, purpose. Admittedly, we got no enhancements done. We had big plans, big dreams, but we wanted to make sure that what we had was meeting the specification 110% and then some. But what we did do is we executed the fundamental arithmetic logic and control instructions that were provided in the baseline ISA. Ideas we had for enhancements that we would have liked to go for. Uh, Enhanced mathematical operations, I really wanted to do things like sine, cosine, tangent, a lot of trig operations, logarithmic functions, um, exponents, stuff that you can do with code, but we're trying to speed up the process, something that's more, something more math intensive that can go get the answers faster. Uh, I've been experimenting a lot with uh, like GPS calculations recently, and the calculations themselves often take up a lot of the memory, a lot of the resolution, especially dealing with lat-long signals. Uh, you're dealing with really deep resolution of uh, flow, floating point things, floating point values. And uh, you need really, there's very complicated math problems that go into it. In order to get real-time, like real-time response to those kind of calculations, you need more hardware in order to substitute less code, take, take the burden off the operator, get rid of the code that goes to it, institute hardware that can substitute for it, and hope they're willing to pay for it. Hmm. Um, improved control operations, that was kind of along the lines of conditional operations, making all operations conditional, mm -hmm. not unlike the uh, ARM processor. Mm -hmm. right. um, that would have been nice. Timer-based interrupts, we feasibly could get this done in probably a couple of days, but we really, want, like I said, we really wanted to focus on the ISA, make sure our ISA was, or our baseline instructions were straight, and so we did that. Um, and then, the one, one I'm, I'm, this one's more, I think, theoretical, or maybe I'm just shooting for the moon here, but data type polymorphism. Now, Brent made fun of me earlier for using that word, but I think in the terms, of, like in the context of C, when you use polymorphism, you're taking one type of variable and sticking it somewhere where it doesn't really belong, but the system adapts to it. In this case, I was using the term to represent sending information back and forth between the integer and the floating point ALE, or uh, register files and allowing them to interpret one another. That, that being said, or, um, case in point, like if I have value one hex in the integer data or in the integer register, and I want to transfer it to the floating point uh, register as one point zero, it would be able to do that. Conceptually, I don't know how that would be done. Maybe a ALU between the two, uh, that, or an ALU in each direction that can transform the data on the way there. Admittedly, it wasn't. That was more of a theoretical thing, but I, I saw the need for it because in my own experiment, like doing stuff at the uh, 8051 last semester and the ARM at times, you run into problems with like, oh, I should do the, like a fractional, fractional results in a division. You could get that from integer values somehow by getting the integer values to the float and then dealing with them there. There's probably a way to do it with code, but I figured have it in hardware, make it faster, that might be a cool thing. I did just set up kind of theoretical, and it probably been done before. I just it seemed kind of cool. And then, the operations. Uh, what it does is that it takes data, data samples, 
and multiplies the coefficient that corresponds with it, which I will talk about it later on. Okay, good. Now we'll talk about some of the features we do have. <laughs> okay, instruction types. We have basic options, basic instruction types that everybody here has. Um, triple, double, single base uh, operands, conditional, unconditional jumps, flag, processor instructions, immediate operand instructions, 8 bit sign extended, and floating point instructions. Uh, the basic format of these instructions. Uh, I don't get the point in it, I didn't get the print at all. Okay. So we have our fields in the top uh, row in each in each section. You can see they're labeled opcode, source one, source two, destination register. That couples covers triple, double, single, and floating point operations. Uh, except that, of course, in the floating point, it'd be pointing to floating point registers. Relative jumps, 24-bit sign displacement gets added to the or yeah added to the um, current instruction pointer value. <sighs> Register address jump calls. That's where you're using the address located in one of the registers, and you're going to that address that we go to. Uh, flags processor instruction format. That's just simple thing. Opcode, opcode only. I know all you guys know this, but bear with me. Um, the basic opcode that basically is just going to tell you to tell the system and do this thing. It's something that the user can't it's like red access registers that the user doesn't have direct control over. They can't direct address, but they want to change the value. In. Uh, case in point would be like if you have a program status register, unless you put it in there, which we did not, I didn't really want to give the user that much control, to the ability to load the program status register in and of itself, but they can flip bits in it individually, uh, enable interrupts, disable interrupts, stuff like that. Um, and then in immediate operand formats, which is not a word, but uh, in immediate operand formats, <laughs> you have your opcode, your source one register, and that's your 8-bit sign extended register, and then it will get dumped in that destination register. Okay, this is our average CPI for all the instructions. If you were to have an if you were to have a code program that had every single one of each instruction, you would have, if you're using our system, 63 one-cycle operations instructions. Sorry, two two-cycle instructions. 10, three time, three cycle instructions, eight, four cycle instructions, three, five cycle instructions. Each one of those also has an interrupt check, a fetch and decode. Decode that one. Yes. This, this, this so each one gets an additional three. They each get an additional three. Yes. yes. We're gonna get your four point six. Right. These alone add up to one forty four. The additional three times eighty six is whatever it was when I did it on my calculator. End state being we have a uh, average clock cycle. Given that you have executed every single instruction in your code of 4.6744 clocks per instruction, now obviously that's based. That's going to be more dependent on the instructions you provided. But I figured just have it. Now you know that's the average running time for everything in there. But the like I said, the, the longest running one we have was five cycles, and majority of the instructions seem to hang out in the one cycle range, and very few happen the two. Similar to uh, Craig, we were. Uh, able to share states from certain instructions, mm -hmm. which admittedly when I went back to do the math for this, it became a bit of an issue. I had to track all those down, <laughs> spend a couple hours looking for those, but found them all and were able to clock them in. What was five cycles? What kind? That was a... There were three of them. It was a jump, or it was a... I want to say it was a call, and it was because the call itself took four cycles. Oh, and because then you had to push, push, push. Stuff. Yeah, I think it was it. Yeah, well, yeah. So those ended up, and because well, that was one of those where we used one of the other states also, like the final part where we actually did the jump. Mm -hmm. So we were able to share a state and kind of reduce our state cost on it, but it did take five cycles. There might be a better way to do it. And we will look into that. <laughs> now Dulcimer is going to take over and explain our machine register sets. Our machine register sets with 64 by 64 reversible registers, sign in integer and floating point. And we have 11 bit um, program status register. And with all some with the enhancement that's pending, we'll probably add one more for the incoming signal from the IO, which sets high if there's a data coming in. Uh, 32 bit memory address register, 32 bit instruction point register. And these are all inside the class interface. 
bit. And 13 bit stack point register. Which they're all, yeah, they're all buffer registers. And the ALU dedicated registers says the product and product buffers and the quotient and remainder. We'll explain the product and product buffer. Well, you guys know the product one, but we'll explain the product buffer when we get to the multiplication issue. Oh yeah, this is from the register that we have. And like I said earlier, we were going to add one more there to for that signal coming in, for the multiply community. And here is the status register from the integer data path. And this is for the interrupt enable. This is for the floating point. Okay, floating point data path. Of note to this, the, the floating point status register flags could very easily, based on what they are, be used for conditional jumps. We didn't institute any of those instructions, but very easily could have been done. Then in that the stash registers themselves represent greater than, greater than, equal, less than. All of those are right there. Probably should have done it. Version two, version two will have that floating point conditional jumps. That'd be version 1.01 or something. 1.01, yes. <laughs> Okay. Oh, go, go for it. You know it. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I know it, but All right. I know it better. All right. We're going to go into our hardware outline real, real quick. First, let's, here's our top level. we got our CPU, like everyone has. We have our memory. We have our input-output peripherals uh, with interrupt and interrupt knowledge up here, which acts as a handshake me a mechanism. Uh, basic chip selects, reads, and writes in my shaky hands. There we go. Clock and reset. Um, all right. Next slide, please. Let's go into the CPU and find out what's inside. Let's go inside. Let's get in there. Oh, what have we got in there? Well, we've got a control unit. We've got a CPU EU. We've got way too many wires right here going between the control unit and the CPU EU that represent the mo a majority of those are the control word. As a matter of fact, in this diagram, I know you can't read them, but you don't even know those. Go read the ISA if you want to know those. Um, all the ones going left to right are all the going to the CPU EU and when we get closer, you may be able to see they're specified in here. If you look in our ISA in the uh, appendix section, you can reference these diagrams, exact same diagrams. They're very clearly labeled, and they're beautiful. I mean, so myself, same as myself. Um, but they're all cordoned off as to, per, to which individual module they go to. Mm -hmm. um, we have at the top, we have the ones that go back to the CU, which would be the, I don't remember right now. IR. But I will get back. Yes. The IR for sure. Yes. Oh, yeah, the IR and the status Flash. register, that's it. Um, let's go to the next slide. Let's push into that CPU EU and see what's going on in there. <laughs> well, what do we got? We got a floating point data point path. We got our IDP, integer data path, and our BIU. Uh, a lot of interconnects. Once again, these are all straight up out of the control words. We have uh, the IR outs, the IA outs. Once again, it's, there's a lot of stuff going on in here to have a diagram where you can see everything at once. Right. It's just not going to happen. But you are more than welcome to look at our ISA. It's available immediately after this presentation. Let's push into the FD FBDB. Pretty basic. Only thing we added, not unlike all of you, is an SMUX right before the S input to the floating point ALU. Experiment with some other stuff. Didn't work for us. Might have worked for you. Uh, we jammed it in there. It works. It feeds in the floating point in out of the read buff, which is in the BIU, uh, and handles all the instructions normal. Admittedly, I have somewhere the, the, sorry, okay. there's a laser. I have somewhere the diagram that shows, I admittedly do not know, I will fully admit this, that I do not know how you float to real works. And there's hardware that goes with that and I wish I did know it. I looked it up, it seemed, it seemed like it might be simple, but I think I was looking at a smaller version of what we were actually doing. But regardless, I'd like to know that, so after this, presentation, I will be going on a personal mission to find out how that works. Anyways, let's get out of here. Let's go over to the IDP. All right. <laughs> the IDP got thrown away out there. I don't know. Uh, we've got the same basic 32 by 64 bit registers you guys all have. Uh, our SMUX has four different inputs in it. One, I don't know if you guys can see that, that is the immediate operand. It takes the immediate operand from the instruction register, sign extends it, kicks it in as a 64 bit. Uh, Science and value. Uh, what else do we have in here? We have the DS that comes in as per the baseline, or as per we had been developed. Have it. The DY we decided to feed into the SMUX as well. 
and what else? Did we put? Oh, and just the S, the regular S from the register file. Um, Ymux gets the traditional values, and I believe that's the only major change we made in here. Yes, it is. All right, so here's the here's the ugly one. All right, so here's our BI view. I really thought that was going to come up bigger, but can you advance one and see if it goes closer? No. Okay, go back. Okay. Um, all right, so we have a floating point buffer. Floating point buffer one, write buffer zero, write buffer one. Program status register, which is only an 11-bit register, which leaves room for more bits. In pretty much any operation, we use that register, including our um, hooks, pushes, and pops. That where it needed, I'm sorry, interrupts. In the interrupts, when it needed to be put, when it needed to be pushed onto the stack, we would push that concatenated with zeros on the end. Um, and we ended up doing that because just uh, pushes and pops ended up requiring a uh, two address push and pop in there. So in order to make everything match up, I figured we're throwing the instruction instruction pointer in there when we uh, get an interrupt anyway. Let's throw the flags on there. So we made them all match up so that any, any, any interaction with the stack pointer will increment, yes, increment two addresses. So you're or two address spaces. So you're going to get 32 bits of the instruction pointer, and then you're going to get the zeros with the program stash register, current contents. Okay, um, when there's a series, pretty much everything in our BIU has a MUX. Every register has a MUX that feeds it with, I think the, the highest one we have has a 4-bit input. And I think there might be two with a 4-bit input. It, I'd have to reference the ISA or the, the code in order to tell you for certain. But it, it's, I know it's a mess. It was really, it's difficult to make this presentable. I did the best I could. So you're just saying that the muxing is within the register itself, kind right. of? Right. It's not the illustrated logic. here. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. I kind of combine That's them okay. because they're in everything. Yeah. I use them all over the place. Yeah. I like them. I like muxes a lot. Right, I friends? like saying mux. Yeah. It's a good word. <laughs> <laughs> we have our tri-state data bus down here. We have our address bus right here. Uh, tri-state. Um, I'm pretty sure, based on what you guys were talking about, and I did some research, I'm pretty sure tri-state uses buffers to control them, um, or that that is one method of implementing a tri-state nice. bus. But, uh, yeah. That's the schematic look, yeah. Right. That's, that's the way I like to see it. Okay, so let's go. Let's see where we're going now. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, this is, this is my favorite. As many of you probably found out, multiplication, if you did a repeating multiplication or any multiplication where you wrote to your own register, something was wrong. Your most significant word was most significantly not correct. Nah. Um, <laughs> after a lot of debugging and stepping through just terrible, terrible lines of code, was able to kind of recognize the pattern and notice that, especially ones where there was a negative inverting, the most significant word was negative, whereas it should be positive. I started to wonder, like, why had we not seen this before? Then I just started, I rerouted my test bench and just started feeding the least significant word out, and I noticed we were getting the value of what should be the, no, the product that was just sent out multiplied by the, the other operand that was coming in. I'm like, okay, that's, we're getting multiplication by itself. So in order to combat this, we instituted in our ALU the Paps Blue Ribbon Register, or the uh, Product Buffer Register. There's two of them, actually. We did one for the R and the S. Initially, we just did one. We turn, then we realized that, oh, if you send it to the other source destination, you're going to get the same problem. Um, of note, and this is why I would not be okay with releasing this as of yet. I would want to do a little bit more investigation. The divide may also have that problem, and I would be concerned about that. Um, as I didn't really have time to test it, given more time to test, I would check that. Because kind of, the more I looked at it, I'm like, this, the logic is similar, mm -hmm. it could happen. And I would, really wouldn't put it past it. Um, we haven't noticed this up until this point because most of itself, even if we did multiplication upon itself, it, was in, it would be the same sign, so values were small, you wouldn't notice the most significant word changing. That's why nobody ever noticed it up until this point. But it did happen. So that's how we combated it. That guy sits before everything, and he basically holds the value of the, uh, he hold, I'm sorry, he holds the value of the operation so that the most significant word has time to process without getting interrupted at the a positive edge by the register being written with the new value. If that doesn't make sense, see me afterwards, I will explain it to you. Uh, okay, next slide. It's a timing problem, right? It is a timing, a timing problem. problem. It's a nightmare of a timing problem. Yeah. But 
but it really wasn't that bad once you figured it out. Okay, so we're going to go into the theoretical enhancements. Uh, just some kind of this case. So I wanted to throw a timer interrupt in. Wouldn't be that tough, I don't think. Uh, here's my conceptual idea, and I'm open to ideas if anybody has any after it. If you think I've got something else I'd add. My concept is we would have a timer. We would have a timer set register that would be addressable by or um, yeah, addressable by the user, so that they could set the timer to whatever they want based on the clock cycle. They would have to know that for the clock frequency. Uh, what's this guy? Dude, this is the mux actually illustrate the mux in this case. The output of the timer, the timer increments by one every time it's clock cycle. Um, the timer would come out, feed back in, so that it can continue to increment. This is a comparator right here, and this is the timer set register. When this value is equal to this value, this line will become hot. This guy, I'm, the timer set register, I would like to have a bit that says, hey, I got, I, oh wait, this works because, I'm sorry, when it receives this signal right here, it resets. And that, so the timer will always go, there will be an interrupt, and the interrupt that comes off is this guy right here. That goes out to the control unit to the so that the control unit can make a decision based on oh the interrupt or the uh, timer went high. The only problem is that there would need to be a handshake probably in there because it needs to be able to know that it happened on the clock cycle or it would just have to be timed properly. But this is all conceptual kind of. Anyways, um, but yeah, so the, and the application of this would be timers are everywhere in processors. They're very useful for users for the processor itself or the system. So I really felt there needed to be a timer based interrupt in there. And uh, now Dos Smurf going to talk about the MAC conceptual. And we've only got two minutes. Okay, you can talk about it fast. Okay, we have MAC multiply and accumulate. It's used in DSV devices. And since we have RISC, it's based on the von Neumann architecture. It's ideal for us. And it takes a. Uh, this is the data sample it's supposed to come in. And this is the corresponding coefficient. And multiply it. And if still the flag is still high. I'll get one more, more value and then we'll add the next one. It constantly uh, adds whatever is in there, but if there's if the number of value comes in from the I.O., it'll raise the flag to zero, so it'll send the output through here. That's the simplest explanation. And that is Six Sigma. Uh, any questions? I wish we had time. Very good job. <laughs> What is that PowerPoint? Uh, what is that?